Well, hello, trans surfers and the trans surfing curious. My name is Xavier Watercane, and I have Renee Garcia with me today on her show, Reality Transplaining. Yay! Oh, yeah. I forgot about the new title. <laughs> awesome. We're such, a, we're such a schmick professional act here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Even my, even my mobile phone went off because I forgot to put it on silent. Because oh, I'm such let a me pro. put mine on silent, too. <laughs> okay. We are good to go. <laughs> okay, so let's so let's get straight to the point because I hate it when people waffle on forever before they get to it. Today we're going to uh, continue the talk on money that we started last week on our previous reality transplanting show. Uh, so today we're sp we're switching roles, and I'm going to be talking to Renee about her money story and some of the techniques that she's worked out to get people a little bit clearer about the whole money monster. Okay. Ooh, money monster. That's a good way money to put monster. it. Yes. Renee, tell us about your money, money story. Monster. <laughs> your money how did monster I slay story. the money dragon? Yes. yes, how did you slay the money dragon? In f well, how did the money dragon show up in your early life? First, let's start with that. Oh, gosh. It's so scary to even talk about. <laughs> it's like, you know, I've, yeah. I've told people this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've told people this a number of times and I've talked about it on my videos before, but when I was struggling with poverty mentality, like even after I figured out ways to make money, but I still had that mindset from my past. I had this mm -hmm. weird image that I had like a mobile home, you know, like, you know how there, there's like these cartoons where a car or some big like thing turned into an actual monster with a mouth open and it was like chasing somebody. That was me, but I had this vision that the trailer that I lived in was like behind me, like, like a Langolier or something. Like I always felt as though it was kind of like this weird character so del that was delving, coming delving for in, me. Delving into your subconscious then, the trailer probably symbolized for you everything there was about poverty, everything there was about your life of lack and limitation, everything that you there was about all of these messages that you'd gotten your entire life about what you could expect out of life, because that's really what it was, wasn't it? It was a whole bunch of messages that contributed to that money story. Yeah, totally, totally. And in the height of my poverty mentality, I actually had a really bizarre experience where I went back to the trailer park and just totally coincidental the mobile home that I grew up in was for sale and they were having an open house and I actually went back inside of it and it was really, really, really scary. And I got, wow. I, it was just, yeah, I know it was really bizarre. I almost had a panic attack in there too. It was really weird. But how, how interesting that you were ready to let go of your, you were on the brink of letting go of your poverty story and yet the trailer was being sold. So it's almost as if the universe were telling you that, okay, it's time that somebody else bought your money, your poverty story, and went through their journey, whatever they might be, in order to get out of it. Yeah. And like here, you can revisit it and it's time to say goodbye. You know, it was really. Did uh... you? Did Go you? Ahead. Did you? Did I say goodbye? Yes. I, I didn't say goodbye at that point. But um, later on, I went back and I actually filmed a video that's on Transurfing TV, one of the exposed videos where I actually am talking in my car in front of the trailer. And yes, it was like it had transformed. It had changed shape. It didn't look the same. Nothing looked the same. And people were looking in the car, walking by like, who the hell are you? And what are you doing here? And I realized like, I don't belong here anymore. This isn't me anymore. It, it was a trip. It was like, it was like, it legitimately looked different, both visually, 
and even just you know this the 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 set and decorations it just all looked very very different the faces didn't look familiar anymore just the whole vibe everything yeah so yeah I did say goodbye it wasn't at that time but I think that was definitely the start of the process for sure okay let's let's talk about an even earlier start which is your childhood growing up in poverty how far back did the generational poverty go how far I mean as far as you know parents 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 how far back did that go forever forever really? it was really? there was no yeah my my grandfather I know this sounds horribly grim and I probably shouldn't even say this on a podcast but my grandfather actually um, made reference to stories that he had gained of you know distant relatives you know a hundred years ago longer when we were in northern Europe during the winter, during really, really hard times, they would actually eat their young, like Donner mm. style stuff, you know? So it was, I think that there's a lot of really deep rooted, very, very serious um, poverty beyond what even I experienced. My grandmother and my great grandmother they came from Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl and they were like straight Okies that everyone, you know, threw stuff at and said, get out of here. And, you know, they were like the low, <laughs> the lowest, the, the lowest for subhumans, you know, they were subhumans. They were cotton pickers. They were field workers. They were cotton pickers. They came out to California and they worked out in the fields and uh, they were farmers and, it was, it was pretty, um, you know, there was a lot of weird, really weird things with food and talking about poverty in a way that it's just like something that you accept. And yeah, it was, um, it was pretty, pretty legit. I have to say, I, I didn't have it as bad as, you know, some people do in the world, but for being an American, it was pretty, um, it was pretty low. The poverty mentality tends to permeate everything. It, it's like, I once read a book about cocaine, about the way that cocaine works. And it started off with a statistic that 99.9% .9 of all money in the United States has traces of cocaine on it. And the author said, why is I this love so? That statistic. <laughs> yeah, it's a great statistic. It is. It's not that every single dollar bill or whatever has been used to snort cocaine. It's just that the ones that have have gone back into circulation and they've contaminated all the other ones that they've touched. Oh my God, that's awesome. <laughs> it is. An, it was an awesome statistic. So it's a bit like that with poverty. It's not that. It's everywhere because it contam the poverty mentality, the poverty worldview contaminates everything it touches. It, it really does. And, you know, I, I struggled for, uh, I mean, the, the worst part of my poverty mentality, the, 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 the place that I found my poverty mentality to be nightmarish was actually when I started to make money that was the oh. worst that was that was like you know it, it not knowing what was wrong and feeling this constant state of you know if I made money I, I was I was all over the place if I made some money my 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 mood and my emotions would be elevated and I would feel as though I was on top of the world. And then if it, the next day, like if I didn't make the same amount of money, I would be devastated, you know, like devastated. And I would think, Oh my God, well, I'm going to lose this money that I just made. And it would, it would go, it would revert. It would like spike. My mood would spike real, real, real high and then so quickly I would experience this tumble from that spike and immediately my thoughts would go a 
thousand percent fear-based thinking responses, taking actions like, okay, well, you know, the other shoe's going to drop and it's, that's probably the last money that I'm going to ever make. So I'm going to really do something to try to make money right now. And I would, I would put myself through hell, you know, just absolute hell. And I was at the mercy of money constantly. Like my whole world was, you know, based around and, and my self-esteem, everything. I mean, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a nightmare. It was really bad. And I had no idea what it was or that it could be solved. I didn't understand poverty mentality. When I started to understand it, I didn't know how to wrap my head around it. And, you know, and then trans surfing came and actually completely resolved the entire thing for me. I still have little things that float in now and again, but I definitely know what they are and I know what to do with them now. And I think that's absolutely like the key to a steady and healthy flow of money now into my life is it's like information comes in or emotions get kicked up and I know exactly where to place them and what to do with them. And this keeps that energetic channel sort of open and the money coming in in a healthy way. And when it doesn't come in, I'm like, okay, cool. I can just like take a break on the thing now. And it's actually a time of relaxation and thinking about other things other than, you know, riding that wave when it comes in. So it's definitely my whole experience has changed. It's a much better way to live. Let me put it that way. Cause I was really suffering for, for a long time. That stage where you have, you're trying to emerge from poverty into a more abundant mentality when making money actually gives you anxiety. I call the junkie monk, the junkie money oh. stage. It's, it's the, the sort of money that junkies have. It's like the hit and yep. then the crash, the hit, and then the crash. It's very symptomatic of oh. getting out of that mentality. A lot of people report that. Let's wind back a bit to how much, let's go, let's try to get a little bit more chronological about this so that people mm -hmm. can out, see the stages of how these things show up. So how did the poverty mentality show up in your life? How did, what did it look like? Um, I guess it looked like I was always in a state of what's in it for me and grabbing, you know, like I was, when I, when I moved to Los Angeles, I didn't have anything. I didn't have any, any kind of notable education. I didn't, I didn't have a college education. I didn't even have my high school diploma. And I was really like, I would go and I mean, some of these thoughts, man, I remember once I was walking in some part of East LA and I was walking into like ice cream shops and gas stations looking for a job, you know? And I think that looking back on it retrospectively, I probably seemed a little bit too suspicious of a character for a job like that. Cause I was young and well-kept, but here I was with no means to provide for myself at all whatsoever. And I would essentially walk into these places and beg for work. I mean, it was really quite pathetic. And people would be like, whoa, who's this chick? Like, why is she here? And I think people were actually suspicious of me. And then I, and then I went to a, um, a dental assisting school and I, and I got this little degree to do this dental assisting work. And I went for a working interview and I remember sitting in the office, just feeling like the lights overhead and the whole vibe of the office, I was like, I'm going to fucking go nuts here. I can't, I can't do this job. Like I, I, I just felt as though I wasn't in the right 
life. I wasn't in the right reality. I wasn't happy. It took me two hours to get to the place in traffic and then to spend eight hours there. I was like, I can't do this. So I gave up on that and I started waitressing. And when I started waitressing- so somebody, so, somebody at some, so somebody at some point did give you a job. Yeah, when I got into the dental assisting thing, oddly enough, that's when people really wanted to hire me. They actually, oh, really? I had, yeah, I had like like offers that they would offer me above what they had said that they were going to pay. And they were really, I got some pretty aggressive offers. But by that point, I was just like, I don't want to work in an office. You know, I was, I just felt like on all levels, it was wrong. And the, the first working interview that I did, it lasted two weeks and it was the last thing I ever did with it. I never took the job. I never looked back. I never, I, it took me almost two years, I think, to get that dental assisting thing. And I never even took the job, you know? And so uh, I was just lost. I didn't know what to do. Okay. So you can't work in an office and a lot of places won't hire you. And I went and I started looking for waitressing jobs and the, it was kind of the same vibe. I remember some manager came out and he was like, it was an Applebee's and he was like, um, why don't you go? There's a fancy restaurant up the street. Why don't you go up to that fancy restaurant? You probably do better up there. So I went up to the fancy restaurant and they were like, yeah, can you, um, can you tend bar? And I was like, not really. If you show me how I'll do it. So they taught me how to tend bar and it was like a really nice upscale restaurant. And I started tending bar and I started waitressing and I started to get a little bit of a vibe of like money a little bit. There were people coming in that had money. There were people, there were people tipping me big. You know, I'd go home with like 150 bucks, 200 bucks in my wallet. And I'd be like, God damn, I've got 200 bucks. I, 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 I think that's an important point for people listening, the, the three people that watch this podcast to, <laughs> to, know, to notice is that it can start off very small. Yes. It just yes. needs that tiny little bit of exposure to some money flow. Whichever way it's happening, even if it's just being around people who already have it, people who have money have a vibe. Totally. And I, I, I caught that vibe. You nailed it. I caught the money vibe. I was like, okay, okay. This is a little bit better than what I'm working with right now. You know, I started- I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to how you su survive for so long, because in Australia, it's not perfect, but we have a very comprehensive- uh, social security system. Uh, we like to think and we like to tell the world that nobody in Australia starves. That's not exactly true, uh, but you really have to work hard in Australia to starve. Mm -hmm. uh, you really have to work. I mean, it's not only just a money men a poverty mentality in Australia, you really have to work and be very, very compromised in order to be really, really bad in Australia, yeah. because there does exist a social security system. It might not be much, but it's a lot better than nothing. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering, I, I know that America doesn't have that, at least not to the same extent. And I'm just wondering how you survive between these stints. Do you just not eat? Well, from 20 to 25 years old, I was actually married and I was in a, a severely abusive relationship where I was, you know, I, I was really treated very, very poorly. And I just, I didn't have any other options. I legit did not have any other options especially when we lived, we lived half the time in the Bay area, which is incredibly expensive. And we lived half the time in Los Angeles and he didn't make much, but it was enough to pay rent and buy groceries. But I was, I was one totally scared to go out on my own. I had no means to provide for myself at all. So I just allowed, you know, whatever was going on within <laughs> you know, the home to continue because I was just so, I, I was so optionless. And two, me being jobless, me not having any options, me not having an education, this was like a really good way for him to have a grip on me. And it was, it was extremely toxic and it was 
very, very scary. And I'm happy actually that looking back that I made it out alive because I could have very well not have for sure. There were times that were that bad for sure. And I have, I have also found that when looking at money, people's money stories that people often report that they're in that because the poverty mentality contaminates everything, you end up not only with not no, not having any financial means of support, but you have no emotional means of support. You're not nourished in other areas. You're, oh, I mean, not, it's not yeah. only just because your diet is bad because you can't afford it, but even if you could have the money, uh, you probably wouldn't be spending it on nutritious food. Uh, people tend oh, yeah. to spend it on drugs or on cigarettes exactly. or on or on uh, alcohol instead of actually nourishing themselves. There seems to be, it's not just about, it's, it's never just about the money. It's about an entire way of approaching life where not only do you restrict what's good, you also end up investing in things that are bad. Like, that was me. <laughs> okay. That was me. That was me. Um, yeah, I you know, had my run with drugs and alcohol. And just like you said, you know, if I got a little bit of money, I'd go out and buy a pack of cigarettes and some drugs. I mean, I'm just going to, it, it is, it, it is what it is. I mean, I was, I was optionless. I was just looking to escape my reality constantly. I mean, yeah, it was a, it was a very sad state of affairs. That's for sure. So you when so when you're looking back now and reframing your story so that it makes some sort of sense because when we're living our story it's often chaotic it's often impulsive we do things in the moment because it seems the appropriate thing to do in the moment the great thing about 2020 hindsight is that it gives us an opportunity to create a narrative that makes parts of this make sense for you in your narrative the story you tell yourself about your past do you think then the moment when you started getting out of the poverty mentality was when you started being exposed to people in this swanky restaurant and the bar that you were beginning to be exposed to the money vibe? Do you think that was the point that things started to change? No, I actually think things really started to change when I found trans surfing. I think that being in Los Angeles and figuring out ways to make money you know, especially when I started my jewelry business and I started to make real money, that actually made the poverty mentality way worse. It was, you know, I mean, the drugs continued, the low self-esteem continued. It was like, it was like piling the issues of money on top of poverty mentality and then it just being like some big confusing toxic soup that I just couldn't I couldn't I couldn't and I'm just like eating it and I don't know why I'm fe not feeling well but I'm making money but the pain's not going away I mean it was really it was really nightmarish actually <laughs> so, so, so this is another so this is another important point I would I would assume then that you were beginning to meet other people, being exposed to other ideas. Opportunities began to, to come out of conversations and why don't you try this? Look, I've got this thing happening. Do you want to get in on this? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I think you're making a very important point there that just because you begin to be exposed to ways of bringing in income does not cure the poverty mentality. All it does is make you very better at getting income, which is not the same thing. Exactly, exactly. The, the solution for the poverty mentality is to lessen your importance surrounding money, not increase it. Now, one thing that the poverty mentality did do for me, and this is you know, speaking to advantage here is I was super, super, super hungry. So like when I started my jewelry business, I mean, looking back on it, I did some pretty risky stuff because I was like, 
I was game. You know what I'm saying? Like I wanted to make the money. So I would do some things looking back on it. I'm like, Jesus, I can't believe you did that. Like show up weird places at night and meet someone at a, in a parking lot to do some high dollar transaction jewelry for cash. And like, I could have been robbed. I could have been killed. I could have all sorts of crazy stuff could have happened to me, but I was so hungry to get out of that place. And at that time, what I equated that to was being ready, willing, and able to show up being ready, like having cash in hand to go and buy merchandise, no matter what the situation was as shady as it was showing up somewhere willing to do it, able to take the merchandise and go and turn it around for a profit. And this is really how I created what I have now, you know, like I was doing stuff that, you know, was helping me to build the foundation of my business, which is still thriving today. And, you know, I was known as the person that was like, Hey, somebody's got this thing to sell. Renee's a buyer. Renee will show up. She'll buy it from you. You know? So my reputation grew very quickly. I was definitely called like people would call me and be like, Hey, I've got this deal for you. And I would show up with cash, you know? So it did help me. And this still remains with me today. And this is probably one of my most you know, treasured characteristics of myself is I have absolutely no problem whatsoever. If I think there's opportunity, I will, I will go and I will show up and I'll show up by myself and I'll get on a plane and I'll fly halfway across the world and I'll show up and I'll people be like, oh my God, I can't believe you actually showed up. Yeah. So I'm like really a go-getter like that. So, but I transformed that from it coming from a place of desperation to, to make money to just a characteristic that I'm really like happy to continue to work with and nourish. It's, it's now good. It's not no longer, um, you know, sort of place of working from desperation. Woody Allen has been quoted as saying 99% of success is showing up. That's exactly it, dude. That's exactly well, really, it. I mean, we often, we, we often talk about taking action. Sometimes the only action we need to take is just to show up. Just to show up, just to show, just up. To show up. Okay, so let's talk about a crucial showing up for you was when you showed up to transurfing. Oh yeah. Because you're saying that that's what took that's what took you out of this whole poverty mentality because you were still making all of this money, but it was coming still out of this sense of desperation, this need for more, that no matter how much you were making, you've said in the past it was never enough. And you kept wanting more and it was never enough. And you kept wondering why you were making money because you'd gotten all of these opportunities and you were willing to show up and it was all working for you at that level, at the surface level, it seemed to be happening. But at the same time, underneath it all, there was this emotional bottomless pit. Oh that God, that's a perfect way to, yeah, yes. This part of the two that could be helped. And also I think there comes a confusion because we're sold this lie that if we make, that making the money will get us out of poverty. Oh, that this is the perfect, this is the perfect, I'm so glad you said that because that sums up exactly what I went through. So when I was young and exposed to extreme poverty, you know, um, trailer parks, cars repossessed, people not having anything, people on welfare, all that kind of stuff. I actually had this seed that embedded itself in me at a young age that if I could make money, I would be happy. If I could just find a way to make money, if I could just be rich, I could find my way out of this and I could be happy. So as I was making more and more money, it was like this absolute chaotic confusion of, wait a second, what the hell is this? I thought that if I made the money, I would be happy. And instead of becoming happier, I actually got less and less and less happier and further away from happiness. And it was absolute chaos in my head. I'm like, I couldn't make sense of it. Well, wait a second. So that's why when people tell me like, 
oh, I just want to be richer. I just want to uh, want the million dollars. I'm like, oh my God, dude, if you got the million dollars right now, you would freak out. It is super, super, super scary when you get the money and then you realize that it didn't do anything for you. In fact, it took you in the opposite direction. <laughs> This, this, this brings up several things for me listening to you. One of them is the American dream that more and more people are realizing is a bit of a nightmare. The American dream being that this is the land of opportunity. This is where you make it. This is where you pull yourself up out of your up with your bootstraps or whatever it is that they do. And, and that somehow the land of opportunity will give you opportunities. But the irony is that you have that. Yes, it is a land of opportunity. You have an enormous economy. You have enormous opportunities to be able to do things that people in smaller economies don't have. The flip side of that is that you took on the opportunity, even though you chased the dream, you took on the opportunity, you showed up, you started making these transactions, money started coming in. It all, but the American dream is based on the idea that, okay, you have the opportunity. If you go, grab opportunity by its cojones, <laughs> it's the, the, the hearts and minds of opportunity will follow and you will end up being in the great place, but yeah. it wasn't a great place for you, was it? Any more than maybe the the Wall Street broker that's making millions and millions of dollars, because I've spoken to these people as well, and what and they call it the golden handcuffs, the oh. golden the golden cha chains. That was you the are, golden handcuffs right there. Yeah, yeah. You get you get totally because that lifestyle necessitates also because it's its own vortex, it's its own pendulum. It wants, it demands things of you. Well, here you know, is your opportunity, but this pro opportunity will cost. And this cost yeah. will be that you're going to have to dress in a particular way. You're going to have to show up in a particular way. There's not, people think that money buys freedom, but often all it does is buy a higher quality of imprisonment. Yeah, totally. Exactly. And you become a slave even more. I mean, at least when you don't have any money, it's like you don't have to answer to anybody. You don't have to. Nobody's coming for you for any reason. When you've got money, I mean, mo money, mo problems. There's a reason why that saying got so popular. It is so true. You know, it brings a bunch of stuff. And then that stuff confines you you know and to this day like now I'm careful about certain things like I like to buy stuff I like to you know especially like the jewelry and stuff like that I'm I'm really into it because I sell it I buy it I sell it but like there's other things that I treat myself to but I make certain that I don't get too used to it. And it's not that I don't get too used to it because, you know, of the poverty mentality things like, oh, well, one day I won't have money and I won't be able to afford it. It's nothing like that. It's just, I don't want to feel as though I need all these things. I want to be able to live with plenty and also be able to live a simple life too. And when you get hooked up on, you know, all kinds of fancy skincare, and fancy cars. You know, now I drive like a really weird little, very cheap car. I could buy myself whatever I wanted to, but I lived that life once before where I needed the newest, latest and greatest, you know, BMW five series with all this stuff. And the thought of like not having that would send me into a panic. I never want to live like that again. It's absolute, it's an absolute nightmare. I mean, to need something like that in life is, but here's the interesting thing. When I was like that and I needed all that stuff, money would come in and it would go to those things. And I wouldn't, I mean, I would grow my wealth, but it's not like I'm, uh, you know, now, I mean, I would grow my wealth, but I was also just funneling a bunch of money into all these things that I needed. Now I don't need the stuff everything's a bonus and my wealth is like really growing now you know and now I really feel rich I drive this little Japanese um, gray market truck that I just bought and had come over from Japan I paid six thousand dollars for it 
I feel like the richest person in the world driving around that little truck. You know what I'm saying? Because all yeah, that other I, money is going into the bank. <laughs> people, people don't, people often don't realize that everything comes at a cost. Everything's a trade-off. People fantasize about living in the great house, but they don't normally automatically equate the great house with great upkeep because yeah. the world is dynamic and things fall apart unless they're maintained, including bodies, including minds, including hearts, including relationships. There's only so many hours in a week. So if you've got the great house, you're either going to have to look after it yourself. Or you're going to have to hire people to look after it for you. The trade-off for that is that you're going to sacrifice some of your privacy because some of these people come into your house and they become part of your lives. My mother, she, she'll hate me if she ever finds this video because she hates the fact that she had to do this, but she cleaned houses for many years. Yeah. She was the classic um, Hispanic housekeeper. Si, senor. Yo, yo lo hago así, bleach, lemon bleach, that sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, and so, and so for years she did that. And she would come back at me sometimes and totally inappropriately regale me with stories about the people that she worked for and intimate details of their private lives. And I thought, wow, thanks for this. Because now I know that if I ever have the big house, I'm not going to have people coming in because they're going to be like you. Uh, <laughs> I was a nanny. Story. I was a nanny for a number of years, so I definitely know what you're talking about. There's like a whole thing there, and it's pretty, uh, yeah, yeah, it's weird. And, it's, and 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 you hear these things from celebrities where they hire people and they have them them sign non-disclosure agreements that are oh, yeah. this big. Because, because, but even, but even then, nasty stories come out like Christina Aguilera um, ringing the the bell for the maid, and she has to traipse halfway across the house just to show up and says, uh, so just so that Christina can say, "Hand me my towel," which is like literally three feet away from her. Yeah. Because she can, and. <laughs> And it's you know, it's fine of... to do that if you're happy. It's fine to do that if you're if you're if you're happy and you've got the money to to I, pay I for. So, but it's also pretty humiliating for the person who's being paid to do that because that's right. I, I I look at that as well and think, mm, yeah, I realize that the part of the deal that you're being paid for is to actually be paid to do something as trivial as that. But at the same time, I think it lessens both people by acting oh, that for way. Sure. For sure. I actually, I actually had an employer once. Um, she, it was a, a woman I was nannying for her husband was some big time CEO of some company and his best friend came over during the day and his best friend and his wife did cocaine together upstairs and God knows what. And then they paid me to lie to the husband <laughs> and tell him something else had been going on. And yeah, so I've had some pretty like extreme exposure to people with money. Um, you know, the person that owned this boat behind me was my boyfriend for a number of years, almost five years, actually. And he had very, very, very extreme wealth. And I know firsthand that uh, it doesn't matter if you've got a billion dollars in the bank, you can still be a fucked up basket case that has poverty mentality and a lot of weird psychological issues with love and money and everything else, you know? So in, so in, case, so in case the people listening to this didn't get it the first time, here it is again. Having money <laughs> does not, having money does not stop you from does not liberate you from the the shackles of the poverty mentality because you can get the, into the golden not. handcuff situation. You can get into the being a just being a dick and being letting dick. the money the, the, letting the money subsidize the, the the dickdom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good way to put it. Exactly. You just wonder what's worse, a, a, a dick without money or a dick with money, because a dick with money can have so much more dickedness that they can do. Totally. And, and if you're and if you're weak, and if you're a weak young gal or young person, 
and you're struggling with poverty mentality, you are ripe for the picking for those sorts of people. So when you lower your levels of importance around money and you place value on becoming, taking action, showing up, getting off the couch and actually doing something to create the money for yourself in a way where you're valuing the way that you create the money, not the actual money, then you have the ability to find some happiness with your wealth. You know, that's, I mean, that's ultimately where I arrived to is now it's like money comes in and I'm like, fuck, this is really nice. It's not everything. One of the things that I've learned to stop doing, and it has been so important in my recovery from poverty mentality is when I make a big chunk of money, I don't go out acting like an idiot. I don't get into these high elevated moods where I spin out, you know, and act weird. It's just money live the same if it's coming in or if it's not, this keeps the channel open energetically. And it doesn't, it's not a mind game at that point. When you remove the mind game, then it actually starts to work, you know? Then and, it starts and, and this, to work. Is, this is what a lot of lottery winners discover because uh, for some reason, energetically, they've been able to pull the trick of bringing in the huge amount of money, often in one lump sum, and then that completely destabilizes everything because it's a little bit like, uh, imagine that there's you have a plot of land and there's just been drought forever, drought forever, drought forever. There is a way of preparing the land so that when the drought breaks, the water goes into the soil, the soil soaks it all up, retains it, it's all under control, and all of those seeds that have been waiting because of sprout can actually finally sprout up. Uh, yep. You see this in parts of Australia, in places which have very little rain for years and years and years, and then one of, and then sometimes you have an El Nino or La Nina event, and suddenly you have a downpour where there usually isn't any uh, water for a long time. All of those seeds that have been in the ground sometimes for years suddenly sprout, and the desert blooms. That's one way of doing it. That's the fun. That's the proper way of handling huge. Um, if you like the water representing income, a huge influx of income at one time and it being managed properly. The other way is to not prepare the ground, not to uh, think about it properly so that when the rain does come, it stays on the surface, causes flash flooding and ruins everything. And that's yeah. what a lot of people that, that have the, the um, sudden influx from a lottery win discover is that they haven't done the groundwork. A lot of them haven't because they're still caught up in the poverty mentality because here's the third time we're saying it, money coming in does not cure poverty. Yeah. I, I, I it actually, I, stabilizes I, I, their lives and it ruins them. Totally. It totally, they call, you know, the ones that die after they win the lottery, you know what they call it? Death by no. misadventure. There's yeah. an actual, they actually label it death by misadventure when you die after you've come across a big chunk well, of money. Well, death, by, death. Mis death by mis misadventure has a broader meaning. It means anything that happens not, and I, I actually interpreted it at a spiritual level that it's some form of suicide. Yeah. But even, at a, at, even at a mundane level, for me, death by misadventure means you've gotten in over your head. You're doing something that you cannot handle and the misadventure often comes because the people that have this sudden influx of money they they do exactly what you've said they go men, they go into this mental crazy state and yeah. this manic and you and we know what people with manic depression are like when they go manic they start behaving erratically they start doing crazy stuff because it's the exuberance of youth it's the little kid that suddenly decides that they're going to bolt have a little bolt around and have a play too often though they end up running onto the freeway and the freeway ends up killing them misadventure comes in the form of and often they'll, they'll end up like taking drugs or something oh wow oh, they yeah. suddenly take all these drugs and they overdose because they're not used to it blah 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 and then they die or 
any number of crazy stuff that happens. And it, 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 it can also be very tragic because it can affect the people. Uh, there are tragic cases in your life. There are the tragic cases, for example, of a man that I had heard his, his his partner took out a hit on him in order to get more of oh, the money yeah. oh, and gosh. He committed suicide from a drug overdose because suddenly he thought he could give her some money to help her out, but all she did was spend it on drugs and died like that. So there's all of this oh. craziness that can happen if you haven't laid the groundwork. Oh. So what I'd, I'd like, what I'd like to talk to you about now is what, was the first idea that came from trans surfing that led you to that led you out of the poverty mentality because funnily enough trans surfing did not lead you to to the place where you were making money as such you did trans surf your way there because we're always trans surfing our way somewhere we're just not doing it consciously so you had unconsciously trans surfed your way into getting a lot of income but you'd not trans surfed your way out of the poverty mentality how did Transurfing ideas help you out of your poverty mentality. So I realized very quickly that, and this goes, you know, this happened right at the beginning of transurfing. I mean, I didn't absorb it right away, but it clicked shortly after, is that even though I was making money and I had figured out the energetic part of money, right? So as I stated in my course, money, making money is really just a product of channeling enough energy into a single endeavor. This is how money is made. You channel enough energy into something and it will shoot out money. It absolutely will shoot out money. So I had figured that part out, but the problem that I still had was I was highlighting the sector of reality that was still poverty, right? So I was still resonating with poverty. I was still, even though I, I, even though I looked fancy and I had jewelry and I had money and all that, I was still resonating with poverty. And I would highlight information and material and evidence and all the stuff in my reality that would support these ideas that oh, you have money now, but the other shoe is going to drop and you're still going to wind up poor. And who knows, maybe in a couple of years, you're going to have to buy a trailer and live somewhere. And, you know, I was still doing that. So the trans serving helped me to formulate this idea that I now adhere to 100%. And this is what I have taught in my money course and my other courses and my vi on my videos and, and on YouTube is that you have two modes of thinking. You have the downward and back version of thinking, which is thinking about all the things you don't like, all the things that aren't working, all the bad things that can happen, all the things that you're not good at, all the ways in which things can be taken from you, all the ways in which things won't work, all that kind of thinking. And then you have the forward and up version of thinking, all the things you are good at, all the things that can work, all the things that are working, all the things that, uh, that could good, uh, good things that could happen to you. And it was so simple. Once I realized it, it was like it just clicked and I moved. I just shifted my gaze and I started looking forward and up. And whenever I started to do the, full, the downward and back version of thinking, I just would catch myself and bring myself again to the forward and up. And I would just I it took a few years. But sure enough, that downward and back is like one percent of my thinking now i just don't fucking do it anymore i just don't do okay. it anymore. so this is the gold point of this particular podcast there is evidence to support all theories therefore if you're carrying a theory in your head downward and backward these are all the things that could go wrong these are all the the things that might not work out. These are all of the opportunities I might miss. These are all of the terrible things that might happen. You can just go on and on and on with that mentality. And surely enough, you stay in that mentality long enough and much as there might be a delay in the mirror, the mirror world starts showing up evidence. There's this wonderful line, and I can't remember what the, the literary work was, but the, but I think it was, um, I think it was a quote from Abraham Lincoln. If you look for the evil in man, you will surely find it. 
I mean, that's the truth. If you, if you look for the evil in situations, you will find it because evidence to support all theories. You maintain a, a theory of a worldview that looks at all of the downward, backward, negative stuff. Evidence will show up. It has to because that's where your focus is and, you, and the world will reflect that. Yeah. So the process is really about looking at that mentality and shifting the gaze, shifting the focus, shifting the worldview to what about all of the things that might go right? What about all of the uh, opportunities that might happen? What about all of the things that could go well? What about all of the things that might just all work out beautifully? Totally. It's, it's, it's mind, it's mind, it's and, mind and, blowing. <laughs> and then, and then things start showing up in your world. The evidence to support that theory shows up as well. And all of a sudden, because also it does, even if you, even if you were to throw out all of the uh, metaphysical, what some people would call the metaphysical new age mumbo jumbo about all of this, even if you would throw that out purely from a materialistically materialistic and psychological point of view the fact is that we have the lives that we have because of the the actions that we take the actions that we take come upon the decisions that we have make the decisions that we make come across because of the way that we feel and the way that we think we change our thinking mm -hmm. we change the way we feel about things we change our decision making we change our actions People who have a prosperity vibe as opposed to a poverty vibe have literally a different vibe. And if we're at all, if all of us are sensitive to situations and people, we know we're in, we're in the presence of people who've got a particular vibe going. I once knew somebody who nobody liked and she complained that nobody wanted to know her, but she, she carried herself in a way that, like, oh, the world is blah, 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 yeah. And she was always it's talking about negative fulfilling stuff. prophecy. Yeah, but it, was always, it was always negative. It was all she was dead. She was Debbie Downer incarnate. Yeah, and, and wondering why people didn't like her. Yeah, and, and she wondered why people didn't like her. And at, at the time, I was very young, so I didn't have the opportunity to tell her. But I would have. But now, I would just sell her. Look at the way that you present yourself to the world. Look at your expectations. Look at the vibe you set out. Nobody wants to be around that who's functional. Yeah. Birds you, of a feather do actually flock together. Totally, totally. And that experience that I had, bartending, and what transpired after that, and things like this, you know, me running in a crowd where, you know, it was, it was challenging. I'll admit, I mean, there were a few social functions where I, I was really, really nervous because I felt as though I was the odd man out and everyone else belonged there, but me. And then at a certain point I was like, you know what? No, fuck it. I'm rich. I'm rich. I might not have the money right now, but I'm going to start acting like a really, really, Bitch. And I'm just gonna. I I'm just. Here. I, belong here. I belong here. I belong here. And you know, if you can convince yourself that you belong there, that's that that you're you, you've done you've 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 won the battle, right? You've won the battle. Everything after that is just the mirror's reflection. So things that I was doing and people I was around and you know, I hate to say it, ways in which I was talking, things that I was wearing, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I was getting into the character, but surely enough, my mirror responded to me. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with the way that, that, that things turned out. I could, I could go and roll in, you know, a billionaire crowd right now and have absolutely no anxiety about it whatsoever. I could walk up and have a face-to-face -face conversation with a billionaire and hold my own, 100%. And I could also walk into a trailer park and I could go and sit on the front porch with a bunch of yokels and totally go to their vibe too and walk away and they would, they would, they would love it. <laughs> 
You know what I'm saying? Like I can do, yeah, I can, yeah. I, I can, I can do it all. I'm not letting any of the se different sectors of reality intimidate me, but it's coming from me. It's absolutely not coming from anything other than me. It's just me. And, and another, and, another thing, and another thing that people need to get. Shakespeare said it right. He said, "We're this the world. The world's a stage. We're players. We're acting out roles." If we can be, if we can embrace the roles as we find them, that's a great thing. The flexibility that you found to be able to embrace roles at both ends of the social spectrum, that's wonderful. Eventually, though, you get so good at role playing that you can begin to write your roles. You can write a new role and you can become the center of a, of a different play altogether instead of, because as difficult as it is to move from the role that you were born in, and as you did learn to play a different role in a different context, because that can take a lot of practice, doesn't it? That does take a lot of practice, doesn't it? Yeah, you found that it, it, takes... it was a process that took years. Yeah. For you. Yeah. For you. But is it as, and that's great, but there is also a higher level of that where you start writing a role, where you start, be, where you start performing in such a way that is consistent with the world that the the timeline that you want to inhabit this is this is a really important point because you can't continue to play the old role in a new play right yeah that's no you you and and i want to touch quickly on when you were talking about the lottery winners and losing their winnings i talk about this specifically in my course that you can only have that which you resonate with. And that's why lottery, lottery winners lose their winnings is because they're not resonating with that amount of money. So it's the same. Well, I resonate with long enough to be able to, ma to manifest it. But this yeah, is the, this or they is the just, or, or, or it was just a freak event of cause and effect. And they somehow, you know, I mean, I don't know. I think that what you can absolutely come in contact with money for sure that you're not resonating with and it falls through your fingers. We've all had that happen, right? We've all caught some sort of windfall that we don't have now. It's a. I, I, would, I would argue that it is impossible for anything to manifest in your life unless you're resonating with it at some level. But what people don't appreciate is that they're multi level beings. We exist in many different places at once even with our, within our own self. And there may be parts of us that resonate strongly enough with something to acquire it, but then the, the acquiring of it is different from the keeping of it. Yes, and the resonating totally. with it and be able to, to exploit that opportunity to the, be, to the best of the ability. They're different parts of our, of our multifaceted selves. And there are people who, for whatever reason, have managed to resonate very strongly in one particular area, the acquisition, but completely fail at the retention, yeah, and com or completely fail at the at the positive exploitation of the experience. Yep. It's like yeah. being given the job. Yes, you got the job, but now you can't sustain it because you can't, do, or you get the great partner, but you can't sustain that because you're not resonating with that partner, and you were only there briefly enough to be able to start the process, but not to be able to continue of it. You need to do the work on yourself. Yes. You need to absolutely work on yourself and work out all of these little kinks inside you because otherwise you're going to blow it. Yeah. You're going to blow it. And that would be a, a real waste because even though you can, even if after blowing it, rejig yourself and get the opportunity again, because why wouldn't that happen? It seems to be rather a shame. Sort it all out first, then let it all happen so that you don't blow it or as a lot of people do play the roles in stages you went from playing little orphan annie <laughs> to <laughs> mommy warbucks but it took a while and no you way. did it in incremental stages and yeah. those stages were always straightforward nor were they always comfortable people people there must be a path in the infinite space of variations, where the path is, e is relatively easy, relatively straightforward, relatively joyful, rel even fun, 
But unless you actually put it out that that's what you're looking for, you're going to get the struggle, the two steps forward, three steps forward, two steps back, whatever. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and also too, speaking on comfort um, and discomfort, you know, there were a lot of times that I had to show up and do things that I was really, really, really uncomfortable doing. Like the first few years that I went to trade shows in my business, it was highly uncomfortable. I didn't have a lot of money to buy. I would show up. There were these very like, you know, fancy trade shows with lots of players and European jewelry dealers and people that would have millions and millions and millions of dollars worth in inventory. And here I came to a trade show with $30,000 to buy jewelry. And I had to really make sure that I did not make any mistakes. I bought the right things that had profit in them and I'd go. And I remember there being times when I would get off the airplane, I would get to the hotel and I would have a minor, minor panic attack that night thinking, God, tomorrow I really got to go and I got to play this role and I got to shake people's hands and I got to write checks and make sure that the checks are going to be <laughs> things that are going to bring me a return back on my money. And I would walk into these trade shows scared shitless and I would be really, really, really uncomfortable. But, but I decided that I was going to make myself comfortable. I was going to get used to it. And God, I don't do them anymore, especially the last couple of years with COVID. But if I went to a trade show now, it would be a totally different thing. You know, a totally different thing. I would walk in, nothing to prove to anyone. No, you know, just saying hi to people that I know that I've known for, you know, almost 20 years now. And like, just doing what I love to do and not, and all the rest is gone all that anxiety all that stuff but that's the thing that most people that's where most people give up is oh I went to the thing and it was uncomfortable and they looked at me weird who cares get over it you got to get over it you got to get over it and you got to just keep going and you will get over it. But most people won't give it that time, you know? Well, the, the, other, the, the other really important point that you're making there is we get back what we put out energetically. So if we're putting out anxiety and a willingness to collapse at the first sign of, re, of resistance, yes. then that's what we're going to get back. We're going to get collapse at the first side of resistance. We're going to find resistance. The truth is the resistance isn't out there. The resistance is in ourselves. Totally. The, 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 totally. The, 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 the trade show didn't really care how you felt. It was your choice to put yourself through that torture. Yeah. It was your choice to decide to feel that way. If you learn anything from transurfing or any other of the reality awakening modalities, is that you need to take responsibility for how you feel about things because totally. how you feel about things is going to change because the, th the thought feeling thing isn't as straightforward as thought creates feelings because feelings can create thoughts. It goes back and forth. Feelings create thoughts, create decisions, create actions. The things don't follow linearly. They all work at the same time, constantly talking and interacting with each other. So at some point, you've just got to sit down and take a good hard look at yourself and pull yourself together and say, okay, I'm responsible for how I feel about this situation. Why don't I just for a little while practice a new way of feeling, a new way of thinking? People often wait too long before they put themselves in these situations. If you had rehearsed feeling better, or thinking better, or acting better, or playing the role. I'm a big believer in rehearsal. Before you ever went to a trade show, you could have you could have asked a friend to say, okay, let's pretend we're in the trade show, and what do you feel? Okay, what are you feeling? I'm feeling anxiety, I'm feeling fear, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's work through that. Take a different point of view. Take an empowered position psychologically, take an empowered position emotionally. Act, give me the performance that I need to make this work. And you could have sorted all that, all that out before you'd even gone into a trade show. 
but you can apply yeah. this to any aspect of your life. Just to spend some time every day rehearsing, even if it's even in the comfort of your own he head. You can be on a bus, you can be on a train, you can be driving through traffic. Instead of being there, just being there enough not to have an accident, but rehearse different ways of being, different interactions with people. I have constant conversations with myself, imaginary conversations with other people. But whenever I find myself having a conversation that isn't going well, I say, wait a minute, I don't have to have this conversation. One thing I have found that's also very useful is... Uh, Oh wait, wait a minute. Let's 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 do a bit of let's do a bit of review before we go on to that. Okay. So just reviewing. Born into poverty, having a poverty mentality, lack constriction, nothing's good enough, I'll never be better, all these horrible messages. Mm -hmm. Bringing learning the tricks of bringing an in income did not li liberate you from that. Because all it did was create a tremendous tension. Last week we talked about cognitive dissonance. Go back to the description for click on to last week's thing. How does that work? There's my finger. Okay, there. Yeah. Whatever, and get and get a and get a and get a better idea of how of how that works. But then that dissonance can't is unstable. It can't last. So you had to find a way out of that. I'm making money, but I still feel poor. Yeah. Now there are two ways that could have gone. You could have stopped making money and then gone back to poverty and thinking. Okay, at least I'm now comfortable in my poverty. Or you could decide, okay, I've now expanded. I will expand into this action that I have created. And that's the path you chose, which is why it worked. I think another thing that's really important for people, another important take-home lesson here for people, is that you chose something that you resonated with. You like jewellery. Yeah. Jewelry works for you. When you see jewelry, it makes you feel inspired. You love the craftsmanship. You love the precious gems. You love the precious metals. You love the artistry. You love the way that it makes people, it, it help enhances aesthetics. There are a whole bunch of stuff about jewelry you really love. Yes? Yes. I love it. Exactly. I was, in, so, I was an Arab trader in another life, and I think I okay. um, traded jewelry. Yeah, right. Okay, fine. So you were an Arab trader in another life, right? I was an Arab trader trading in food. So I really like to have really lovely food experiences, etc. Okay. The point is, whatever it is that you do, it doesn't matter what it is, find something that you already resonate with. There are going to be people out yeah. there saying, yeah, yeah, but yeah, but Renee, Exy, I, I don't resonate with anything. And I'm saying, and I'm going to argue that that's not true. You just haven't looked hard enough yet. There will be something no matter how, and it doesn't matter what other people think about it. What matters is that you resonate with that thing. And that will be the seed that starts a whole ball, ball rolling. Yeah. And then, and then transurfing ideas can help with that because it can say, okay, well, it forces you to look at how the, the world mirrors you and how the theory that you're carrying with you, the story that you're carrying with you, will be reflected in your reality. Even if it's just at a purely psychological level of just the way you interact with people. I love it. That's, that's okay. where it's at. That's where it's so, at. So I would like to um, give people some another um, uh, action steps that they can take. Would you like to start that ball rolling and maybe give some some people an exercise um, that they can do or something that they can do just to get them out of the poverty mentality mm, is there something in an your, exercise in your yeah an exercise to get out of poverty mentality um do you have something or do you want to save that to later no 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 i i mean i can think of something on the fly it's really it's really just as easy as catching yourself whenever oh i've got the perfect exercise and this is such a this is such a powerful thing to do is the next time you have a lower nature thought about your finances money um maybe other people having money like oh they have money and they're whatever just some 
not good way of thinking to retrace that thought as far back as you can. When is the last time, other than the time where you're catching yourself, when's the last time you had that thought? And then have the, how about the time before that? And then the time before that. And try to go back in your life to the very, very first time that you had either that thought or a similar thought. Or what experience did you have that triggered a thought like that? And this is like, it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz seeing the, the dude behind the curtain and realizing that it's just a dude behind the curtain. A lot of times our super limiting beliefs were just like you being five years old and hearing your mom say something about they didn't have uh, the money to clear a check for $27 and 16 cents. And this mm. something That's very happened. Specific. Huh? That's very specific. <laughs> yes. Um, the, the, what, what you're talking about is, is personal archaeology and digging for triggers. So you're digging looking for triggers looking, there. That's we, it. We, we can call this the digging for triggers exercise. Yes. Can you give us an example from your life of you going through the digging for triggers exercise? So I have a good digging for triggers exercise that both trigger money and self-love. I remember once I was probably six or seven years old and I saw a girl with toenail polish on at my school. And the next time we were at a shop, I asked my mom if she would buy me a, a bottle of, of fingernail polish. She said, why? I said, I wanna take paint my toenails. And she said, painting your toenails are for rich women who have nothing better to do. And that just, self-care, right? Don't make yourself look pretty. And that bottle of nail polish is for rich women. For years, I felt weird painting my toenails, buying nail polish, going and getting a manicure, all of that kind of stuff. I would feel super bizarre about it. And I didn't really understand why. And I remember once I was having a pedicure and I was feeling super guilty sitting there and the lady was rubbing my feet and I felt this tremendous sensation of guilt. And I did this thing and I went back and I found that little seed <laughs> It embedded itself and grew into all sorts of weird little psychological cookie things about toenail polish and pedicures. <laughs> that, so, that's, so, that's so interesting because that one event led you to create this very uncomfortable vibration around self-care, self-love, self-pampering and money and you conflated all that and it made so you could even go through the motions of having it done on the surface but underneath there were all these squishy horrible feelings all the time yes and that took a while to clear and that took a while to clear and now when oh, i get a pedicure i'm like yeah rub my feet oh yeah. yeah you know i'm like rub them harder i'll give you 10 bucks more <laughs> I'm like all in it, you know? <laughs> I'm sure there are any number of people that can relate to that story. Do you want to hear mine? Yes, absolutely. This, this, is, all, this one is also about money and guilt. Now, I have said in the past that my, that, uh, my family were not particularly wealthy. The funny thing is, though, that my father had come from a very wealthy background but he was like the black sheep of the family that squandered it all. And my mother had come, had had, so he, his story was up money down, up money down. Uh, my mother's was the exact opposite. She'd grown up in extreme poverty to the point where when she, she told me stories that when, when she was like seven years old, she and her slightly older brother would go to the markets at the end of the day and beg for the, uh, seconds and partly rotten fruit and vegetables so that they, for the store, from the store owners who were only going to throw that out to bring them home so that the, the, their mother could cut off all the nasty bits and use the good bits for cooking. That's how poor they were. Mm. But then what happened was that my mother, because she was pretty, 
was able to do what a lot of pretty women did was that she found herself uh, modeling and all of a sudden money came in. Uh, also as a result of that, she got herself a rather rich boyfriend. The boyfriend at one point gave her a uh, mink stole. No, no, Ooh. otter stole. Yeah, it was, it was made from otter fur back before when, 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 when having live animal fur was still PC because nobody ever had thought about PC before. Anyway, very luxurious coat, et cetera, et cetera, that she kept for years. Anyway, the reason I'm going into this background, because it's very interesting that I go from a father that went from here to here and a mother that went to here from here to there and then down again. So it was a very, very, very confused stories about poverty and uh, money and value and wealth and all that sort of stuff. Totally screwed up, totally screwed up. Anyway, it's fast forward, I'm, my, my parents are married, I'm born, we emigrate to Australia from Argentina. Uh, I am in kindergarten. And what my mother had done was that she had tired of the coat after a while. It was getting a bit old and ratty. And so what she had done yeah, is that I had... Do. A, yes, as first do. Uh, I had a toy kangaroo, uh, one of those plush soft toys. And it was getting a bit sort of overloved. Um, and my mother decided, as she did, because that's where her mind worked, that she would recover the, the, the fur on the kangaroo. So what did she do? Was she recovered the kangaroo with otter fur. So I ended up having this thing, this, this soft toy, this plush toy, that if you had bought it would have cost at the time the equivalent of $1,000, <laughs> purely because on the basis of the quality of the materials it was made of. Even though, even though, at home, generally, there was our money was hard to buy. Well, this was like a relic of a rich past. So I had this. Relic, <laughs> so I had, so I had this relic of a rich past. Yet another weird, confusing, contradictory story. But it gets worse. So comes the day that we had at kindergarten. Uh, it was like toy show day, where everybody would bring in their favourite toy. And I'm five years old. What do I know about stuff? <laughs> but I bring in this fur, this, this plush, incredibly like Cartier type toy into school. Now, and, the, and I remember vaguely to, the, the teachers would ask me, well, gee, that's very nice fur. What is it? I said, it's otter. <laughs> and, and see, and getting the look on their faces like, Otter, <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> but it gets worse because there was this kid um, it, in uh, kindergarten who had uh, emigrated from the Middle East. He was like the youngest child of a very, very poor Arab family that had obviously, I only realize this in retrospect, had probably come out of some sort of war. They were refugees, they had less than nothing. And they were a large family, so they went. There was less than nothing, and he didn't speak English, so he's isolated. And my heart always went out to him because I didn't speak Arabic, and he and I didn't have anything in common because I was a weird kid, and he was a kid that liked sports and blah blah blah. So I couldn't even relate to him. So I never made any attempt to relate to him, but he barely got the idea that it was toy day, and so what he so. I remember a teacher asking him, do you have any toy? Because it's toy day. And, he, and what he pulled out of the, his pocket was one of those little plastic bubbles that you get from gumdrop machines that have a little toy inside them. And that was, and when he did that in my presence, that was my money guilt. Wait, 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 wait. Let me get yeah, this yeah. straight. It was just the plastic covering for the toy. No, no, it was it had a little toy inside it as well. But that oh, was it what had it a had. Little toy. Oh, little got it. Plastic oh, toy. Okay. It had a little toy inside baby. it as well. But that but that yeah, but that was my money guilt um what's the word I'm looking for? Moment of truth. Yeah. Oh and I thought, and I thought 
here I am, because I knew, because my mother would tell me what uh, about the, the fur coat and all of that sort of stuff. So I knew enough to realize that what I had was just light years away from what this kid had. And yeah. I just felt really bad. Oh gosh, I know, yeah. <laughs> like, I... And, that, and that really affected me for years. Oh. And it still does to this, and it still does to this day because there are the haves and the have nots. Yeah. And it really was the first time I realized that there were, that much as I might have, because I knew that we weren't great, that, that things weren't great at home with money, I knew that whatever I had was a lot more than what he had. Yeah. Oh, wow. I know. I, I totally know. I totally know what you're talking about. I, I still have little things now that I have money. Like yesterday, I saw something walking down the street. There was a newspaper that said um, 25 refugees placed in town from Afghanistan. And my initial thought was, oh, you got to go give them some money. Go, go. You got to go help them. They're, <laughs> they've got nothing. They're coming here. They're in trauma. They've got nothing. You got to go help them, you know? And I have to kind of like, okay, slow down. There's lots of programs going on. There's lots of people taking care of these people right now. Don't, you know, like you, like I can totally get into this thing. I can be overly generous to the extent where um, it is not coming from a good place. Yeah, if, yeah, if no. it's coming from if it's coming from guilt, if it's coming from that squirmy, horrible I feeling, do, I can really, do that sometimes. Yeah, and and we all of us can, but it's not a very good place to come from. Much better yeah. to recognize that when when we do have resources, I know that I do quite a lot of good stuff with what I have. I actually make quite a few people's lives better and animals' lives better and all that sort of stuff. I already do that. But yeah. that does but that doesn't I still go the, the five year old self still looks back at that moment and I it's not difficult for me to recreate that feeling of oh oh I I I almost I wasn't going to do it, but I was almost willing to give him the, my my kangaroo because I just felt so bad about it. And yeah. also I and also what 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 disturbed me about that story was that I remember also looking around and everybody else was oblivious to this. Oh yeah. It's like you, it was you, really, know, you can, it was, it was really just something that was happening in my head. Perhaps the teacher also, I, the teacher probably saw it for sure. Saw it as well, but she didn't talk to me about it. She didn't approach me about it and say, are you okay? Because I was actually quite upset. Yeah. But I was, but I'm also, oh. but I was very good at, but I was very good at masking how I felt. It, I, and I was the weird kid anyway. So, but I think it's really interesting how these stories evolve. Um, I would like to share another uh, before we sign off. Another exercise that people can do. Yes, exercises are good, and everyone exercise. loved your exercise last time. So if you missed that, definitely go back. And take a look at the exercise from last week. That there's one was, there's uh, the powerful. link, or there's there's the link, or wherever it is. So here's a here's the. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure the editor, our, our, our delightful editor, can find some way of putting in the thing or not. <laughs> Who knows? So here's yeah. an exercise. So here's an exercise. This is a this is an exercise to just to get a lot of that out of the way, and it comes. And this again will work more for wordy people, but it can also work for people who have um, physical, uh, who are more physical in the way that they do things. And this is about creating an, a particular anchor. So what you do is you sit down with yourself and you think of all of the one, think of a number of, of really positive um, ideas around money. Like if I had, ask yourself, for example, if I had money, what would I feel? I would feel secure, I would feel safe, I would feel abundant, I would feel a sense of expansion, whatever it is, because it's going to be different for everybody. And there's no right or wrong here. It's whatever works for you. Because some people don't give a crap about safety. But some people really like the idea of the, the expansiveness and openness, or whatever, or opportunity, whatever resonates with you, just write a whole bunch of ideas down. 
okay? And I call this exercise the single word dictionary, because what you're going to do now is that you're going to attach all of those meanings to a single word. It doesn't have to be a, an existing word. It can be a made up word that you make up. But as long as it's a distinctive word, you don't even have to share this word with anybody else. It can be a word that only you know but you attach all of these meanings and that little word becomes your mantra. So you say that to yourself constantly and you reread your list, you augment it, you change it, you edit it, however you like. But what happens is that all of these ideas and how these ideas feel, expansiveness, openness, security, uh, wealth, richness, luxury, pampering, you can just go on and on with all of the adjectives or even scenes. I'm sitting in a pool and it's a beautiful tropical sunset and I'm and I'm sipping a cool drink and the warm tropical waters lapping against my feet that sort of stuff or if you like a more temperate climate you can be on top of a mountain and the sense of the grandeur as the as the mountains spread out before you whatever whatever it is that makes you feel good all of that imagery you attach to one word and that word becomes the single word in that single entry dictionary that says okay this is the word. And then that word becomes a mantra that you say to yourself over and over again whenever you remember to say it. Because that's a Love shortcut it. way of, of, of channeling all of that good feeling information. It's just about creating a good feeling. It's not about anything else. It's just about raising that whole emotional vibe so you're not stuck in some sort of dumps. And also it's, a, it's, it's faster to do that and say that word in your head over and over again than to than to say all of these things in a rote fashion, because it's possible to go through the list and you're just saying it, you're saying it and you're saying it. That can get boring, in which case all you're doing is sending out the boring vibe, which really doesn't yeah. help. So, so you're associating you, the word to a sensation. Yes, it's really vital that you associate the word to the sensations that the other words have evoked in you, right? Because the words will evoke a sensation. I love it. A feeling of a like I said, a feeling of abundance, of plentitude, of flow, of freedom, whatever you imagine money would give you, right? Because as we've learned from this podcast, for those of us who are, for those of you who are still with us, what we've learned is that, as, that the money itself is meaningless if it won't provide you with the experience that you think it will provide you with. Oh, and if God, it that's such doesn't. a great way to wrap it up. Really, that's awesome. Because you got to feel it. Otherwise, you're just going to be. Otherwise, it's just going to be a bunch of numbers and it's going to be one more burden. And you don't want to do that. The whole point of money is that it should be liberating and not create an, and not create a burden. So whatever you imagine that money would give you, you, get, you, you write down those imaginings you cultivate those feelings in yourself and then you attach all those feelings to a made up word that only you know, only you and God or whatever, and then you chant that word to yourself and that becomes a mantra. Now, the other thing is that you, for the people who aren't wordy types, who are more physical, you can attach it to an object, right? You can just pick Perfect an object. Intention. Yeah, exactly. You, you, could, you for That's yourself, you is. could attach it to a, yeah. Right, you attach it to a piece of jewelry, for example. Other yeah. people might attach it to a pot, uh, attach it to a pot plant. Other people might attach it to an item of clothing, or it might even be a particular place in their in their where they live. They might even have a little shrine somewhere that means nothing to anybody but to them. But all of those meanings of positive joyfulness are attached to this thing. It could be a crystal. It could be anything physical. It could be something human made. It can be something that's natural. It doesn't matter. We just went over that. That's an artifact of intention. That's in the new hacking the technogenic system lesson, and it's really, really powerful, exactly. and it really, exactly. really works. Exactly. So the artifact of intention can also be a word. It can mm. be the mantra. Right. It can be anything. All you're really doing is hooking up a whole bunch of really positive vibes and feelings to a, a particular thing. Invoke often. It. Invoke Ooh. often, and that'll take you to. And that'll take you to a place where your thoughts will lead you to a place where your feelings will lead you to a place which will lead you to decisions, which will lead you to actions, which will lead you to transferring your way out of your current timeline into a better timeline because the mirror will show up more and more stuff because your focus of attention has, has shifted. Okay, so that's... <laughs> 
<laughs> so that's something that people can do. Yeah. I love it. It's so good. It's so good. I'm sure people are going to love it because we just went over that with the artifact of intention and now for it to be a word and to also incorporate sensations rather than just an intention or a goal. It's going to be really, really powerful. So that was a yeah, great and, and, place and, to seal the deal. This, yeah, because then you'll feel inspired to act in a particular way and you'll start role playing as well. That's consistent with that vision, what that word means it. to you. I love it. I've got my, I'm, I've got a word that I don't share with anybody, but it doesn't matter because it's for my, it's for me. I encourage people not to share that word, just to keep it to yourself, but then say mm. it to yourself as often as you like. And that remind, even if it's just a reminder of how life could be. Yeah. And staying in that intent, shifting the focus, shifting the feeling, shifting the emotion, shifting the actions, all in that thing. I'm gonna pick my word tonight. You you do that. You do that, Renee. You did. You did. You go, girl. You pick that word, Renee. You pick that word. All right, everybody. Next week, That's we don't weird. know what we're talking about, but we're going to talk about something. <laughs> so tune in for the next one. Do you want to sign off officially since you opened it and you got to close it? Oh, you open her, okay, you got to close her. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Thank you for staying with us. We hope this has been an enlightening and wonderful experience for you. We hope that you can take something from this that will improve and enhance your own lives. Um, and if you have any questions, by all means, send them to Renee somehow. Gets yes. to us somehow. Comment, but, um, comment, any, comment any questions you have and we will answer them on the next week. Yes, on the, oh. on, on the next installment of Reality Transplaining. With All Renee right, Garcia. And, and Major Water Watergate. Watergate. <laughs> All right. Bye, y'all. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.